it says m applied to n evaluates to v primes just when m evaluates to some lambda abstraction, n evaluates to some value, and then the body of the lambda abstraction, m primed, with v, the value to which n um, evaluated, substituted for x, um, evaluates to v primed. So you can see that we evaluate the argument to a function um, before we substitute it into the body. In call by name, uh, on the other hand, uh, we don't do that. If we have an application in call by name, then if m evaluates to lambda x dot m primed, then we just go straight ahead and substitute n, the argument unevaluated for x, into, into m primed. And operationally, now, there's a choice. I mean, actually, there's a choice what we think we're doing when we do this, right? So, so one thing, if we take this as a language definition, what we're interested in is what's the correct, what is the uh, observable behavior of programs in this language? Okay. So the precise form of rules that we, that we choose here uh, doesn't really matter. We're really only interested in this as a relation. This program, this complete program, evaluates to this answer or diverges or whatever. Um, and so the intermediate steps in here, exactly what the derivation looks like, is not of importance if we're thinking about the definition of a programming language. But another thing is we can read this as telling us something about a possible strategy for actually going ahead and running programs in this language, in which case we care about this stuff. And the, thing, the sorts of things I said about we substitute arguments in um, uh, unevaluated are, are things which happen in the actual machine when it's running your program. Um, but the fact it's important to realize that you can read these definitions, although everyone's seen this a hundred times before, you can read what it's saying in two different ways. Either it's just defining the language or it's actually telling you something about an intended implementation. Um, and I tend to the uh, defining the language um, uh, 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 school of thought because we're going to be, we're, we're really only using this as a stepping stone to define uh, to define the equational theory of the language, and then it's up to the compiler to do whatever it likes to implement that behavior um, for us. I don't expect a kind of close correspondence in intermediate states and, uh, and things in the, um, in the operational semantics. So we can give this language of simple types a denotational semantics, and because it's not got any divergence in, we don't have to do anything very, uh, very clever. We can just interpret it in sets and functions. So um, the way the, the shape, general shape of a denotational semantics like this is that for each, for each type in the programming language, we're going to interpret it as some set, and each term in the programming language is going to be interpreted as a function from the interpretation of the context uh, into the interpretation of the, the type that the, um, that the expression has. So it's an inductive definition of the meaning of type, so it says we'll interpret the type integer in the programming language as the set Z of integers in mathematics, and we'll interpret the unit type as the one-point set, and we'll interpret um, the product type in the programming language as the Cartesian product in sets of the interpretations of the two types involved. I should probably have used a star in here or something to distinguish syntax over here from semantics over here. Uh, the meaning of a function type is the function between the, fun the space of functions between the meanings. Um, disjoint union interprets the, the uh, disjoint union type, and the meaning of uh, an environment, a type environment, these gammas that we have in the type derivations, so x1 of type a1 up to xn of type an, that that will be interpreted as just the Cartesian product of uh, the interpretations of all the types in here. So our denotational semantics is going to do a little bit of, com of, um, of, uh, of compilation, really, um, because we're going to replace the variable names that we use in typing derivations by <coughs> numeric accesses to the environment in the semantics, which avoids us having to kind of carry variable names around. So, in particular, when I have, uh, so now, now I'm going to interpret, have I not got the meaning of judgments? I've not got the meaning of judgments. So I'm going to interpret um, uh, each judgment as a function from the interpretation of the context on the left to the interpretation of the type on the right. And we interpret variables by taking the i, so the ith variable in the list is, is interpreted by the ith projection applied to um, this big, uh, uh, big product interpreting the context. And so pairs are interpreted by taking the pa pairing up the interpretations. Lambda abstractions are interpreted by functions in the meta language, in mathematics. So, so over here, this is lambda x dot m of type a to b in our programming language. And over here, we have the mathematical function which takes an a in the interpretation of, a, of, of the type a and returns you the interpretation of the, type of the term m um, in the environment row extended with um, the, uh, the value that was passed in here. So that's the general shape of, of semantics that we'll be using uh, over and over again. <coughs> so this denotational semantics justifies lots of equations again. 
Um, so once more, we can define contextual equivalence. We have to be a little bit more careful because we've got types and interesting things like that around. But we'll say M is contextually equivalent to N at type A in context gamma, just when, whenever you give me a whole program, which for the sake of argument we may as well take to be a closed term of type uh, int, um, if, you, if, if this context has a hole, which I sort of invent some notation for here, so, so this means this is a term with a hole in, such that if you plug in a term which has type A in context gamma, then the result of plugging that term in for the hole will all have, uh, will have type int. Then uh, CM evaluates when, if and only if uh, uh, CN evaluates for N. <coughs> so, so this, this, um, this uh, 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 notion of equality uh, is... Uh, uh, has, um, uh, these equations um, uh, are valid contextual equivalences. So the beta laws, the usual thing, it says that um, uh, lambda x dot m applied to n is equal to m with n for x, and that means that the denotational semantics of this thing on this side is actually mathematically equal to the denotational semantics of the thing on the other side. Um, first of mn is equal to m, and likewise for, for second. Um, we have a case statement, the meaning of a case statement when we know the, left, the, the, the branches in left of M is what you get by taking the, this branch here and substituting M for X, um, and so on. Uh, addition is commutative. And then we also have, as well as these beta rules, we also have uh, eta rules. Um, so any term of type unit um, uh, is, uh, is equal to any other term of type unit. Um, any, any M, which is, I should put types on here, but it fills the slide up. Any M of functional type is equal to what you get by eta expanding it. So contextually equivalent. You can't tell the difference between M of type A to B and the function lambda X, M applied to X, if you pick some X that's not in, uh, um, uh, in M. So, uh, so this is because you know, these things are different terms, but the only thing that you ever do to a function to, um, to test it on its way to evaluating to, uh, uh, to the final result of your program is you apply it to something. And if you, you can see that if you apply this eta expanded function to an argument, you end up doing the same thing as you would have done if you'd applied uh, M. Similarly, anything of pair type is actually a pair. So this says anything of a function type is a function. This says anything of a pair type is a pair. So any M of, of type uh, A cross B is, is uh, um, semantically equal to what you get by taking its first projection, take its second projection, and pairing the two guys up together. And we also have eta rules for products for coproducts. So this is all very nice. Now, the, so these sorts of equations, if you like, this is, almost, this is what we mean by pure, okay? So, so people talk about pure and impure and so forth. But what, we really, what we really mean is that we have lots of, no, pure, pure really means we've got lots of nice equations. And these are the canonical nice equations for, for programs with functions in. Um, and kind of the, the more we diverge from this, the more impure we are. Um, <coughs> so although we interpreted this in set, there's a general class of, uh, of category from which we can interpret this language, where the same thing will be true. So, so that class is Cartesian closed categories, or at least, well, by Cartesian closed categories, because we've got coproducts in here. So, that's, so, so set is a sort of canonical example of such a thing, but anything which has sort of set-like objects and function-like objects that behave themselves uh, according to these beta and eta rules will do as an, as an interpretation of this language. So we quite often like to take that extra step of abstraction and say, instead of working in this particular concrete category, we're going to do a lot of our work in general terms because then occasionally, just occasionally, um, we find that we can move to another category and say, oh yes, all that work we did before transfers over because, uh, because that shares the, uh, the structure that we use. <coughs> so if we want to add recursion, um, Suddenly, the difference between call by value and call by name starts to, uh, starts to show up. So if we add recursion to our call by value language, um, if you look at a language like ML, you'll notice you can't make recursive definitions of, um, of, of arbitrary um, type terms because the only thing that has a kind of computation in that gets stopped is a function. It's the only thing that's funked up that has any, any kind of uh, potentially divergent behavior that can ever be stopped. You make a recursive definition of a pair, at least in standard ML, uh, I believe a camel actually does let you do these things, um, uh, then um, under the rules I gave you, it would just always diverge, so there'd be no point. So the only things we can define recursively in call by value are, uh, are functions. So, so here's the typing rule for that. So this says, if M is an expression of type B in a context where X has type A and F has type A arrow B, so F is going to be the name by which we refer to the function that we're recursively defining in the body, then rec FX equals M has type A arrow B. Okay, so this is recursive definition of a function f of x equals m, where f is allowed to occur inside the body um, m. 
So uh, evaluation rule for that in call by value, you evaluate, this, is a, this is a value by the way, um, and if M evaluates for such a, a rec term, N evaluates for V, and then, yes? In the second line, you um, rec F er A arrow B X. Oh yes, sorry, so I want to put typing annotations on these things to, uh, um, to make typing derivations unique. So if you read this as just um, rec F X equals M, like I've written it here, and then, what I want to do is I want to put a, I want to put a type tag on it. It's just a bit awkward to work out where to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a bit awkward to kind of pl place it. I mean, I could put subscripts or something like that. Um, okay. Um, so, um, so, right, so then the body unfolds as follows. You substitute uh, the, the value of the argument in for x, and then you substitute, you unfold the, uh, the recursive definition of the function itself. So you substitute rec fx equals m primed in for, in for f. So each time you apply the function, you get to unfold the, the definition of the function as well. So now we've got divergence in the language. So it's a canonical divergent term here. So rec fx equals fx um, applied to something. You'll discover that that doesn't evaluate under this big step evaluation in relation to anything. And if I'd done a small step, it would, it would step forever. So now the presence of this in the language now messes up the pretty equational theory that we had for the simple type language. So it's no longer the case that lambda x dot m applied to n is observationally indistinguishable from m with n substituted for x the way it was before. So if we consider, here's an example. So here's a function lambda x dot unit. Um, so it takes its argument, throws it away, returns unit. And if I apply it to this divergent term here, then, well, if I substitute omega in for all currencies of x, there aren't any. So this thing is just um, the unit expression. Uh, but if I actually run uh, the, the unsubstituted expression, the first thing I would do is attempt, I could only prove that this uh, terminates uh, to something if I could see that omega terminated to something <coughs> and, um, and uh, it just doesn't. So suddenly the equational theory's got messed up. Um, but we can sort of make a, uh, put a side condition version. It is true that lambda x dot m applied to v for any value v <coughs> is uh, observationally indistinguishable with m for v for x. So we replace our nice beta rule with one with a side condition that says if it's a value, then it's okay to do, otherwise not. Um, similarly, uh, the, uh, the equations for pairs have got slightly broken. So first of m1 and m2 is not equal to m1 at all times, again, because m2 might diverge, and we always go off and evaluate these guys eagerly before we, before we take the projection. But we can recover something by saying first of v1, v2 is always equal to v1. So if both the guys in here are values, then first works. And I guess we could have probably done it if we put a v here and uh, a, a general m in here. Um, and our eta expressions are broken too, right? So it's not true that any expression of functional type is equal to an explicit lambda abstraction. This, so m is not generally equal to lambda x mx because this guy is always a value, um, and this guy could be a divergent computation of functional type. Okay, so this thing is typeable at any type, so, so omega at functional type on the left-hand side. So we would be able to tell the difference between those two things. So adding recursion has kind of messed up our equational theory a bit. We can recover something, but it's not the same as it was before. And called by name language, uh, we can add recursion at any type, uh, hence the fact that uh, real uh, call by name programming languages let you define infinite data structures as well as recursive functions. Um, so the typing rule is a bit simpler. So rec x dot m has type a if you can prove that m has type a under assumption that 